Hey y'all, how you doing? Hope you're having a great day. And today we're going to be talking about the Schrodinger Heisenberg interaction pictures of quantum mechanics. And this is going to be a clear explanation as opposed to every explanation I've ran into, which is infinitely confusing because I've been thinking about these things for approximately a month now. And I've only recently... They've only recently become clear to me. For example, if you check out the Wikipedia article, it's not very clear, and I don't like some things that people do when they talk about this. And I'll say what those things are as we go through this. So, first off, we're going to start by assuming that we know the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Um... And then we're going to have to solve it, and from our solution, we're going to group certain things together, and those will give us the certain pictures. So, the time-dependent Schrodinger equ equation reads IH bar d psi, which depends on t, dt equals the Hamiltonian, which may or may not depend on time, times the wave function. Okay, and so the most general solution to this equation, which is a first-order linear homogeneous differential equation, you can look those up in your diff EQ book. It's usually on the first chapter. It's one of the easiest differential equations to solve. That solution reads psi of t is equal to e to the negative i over h bar integrated from 0 to t of the Hamiltonian. We have to make a dummy in this here, so we'll call it t prime, dt prime, and then psi of 0. So we're assuming our initial conditions are at time t equals 0, our wave function is psi of zero, um, and that's why our lower bound is zero here. So this is the most general form of the solution. Now, one thing which you commonly see done is that the Hamiltonian is split up into a time-independent part and a time-dependent part. So you might see the Hamiltonian, which I'm writing it like this, the total Hamiltonian is usually split up into a sum, and one part doesn't depend on time. I'll call that H0 plus a part that does depend on time. I'll call that V of T. For example, this is done in perturbation theory, time-dependent perturbation theory. And this V of T here, sometimes you'll see it as H superscript 1 of T. Um, and this, it's usually always called H naught. So, if we plug this in for H here, we can split up the integral. Now, let's do that now. Okay, so what I did there was plug this in up here, and I solved everything. And right here, I took this time-independent Hamiltonian out of the integral, and all we got was t out. And then can't really do anything with this other integral now. Now, these are three distinct mm, things, and we can call these things 1... Two and three. And the way that these are combined is just um, the way you think about the different pictures. For example, you can combine two and three and say that's the wave function, and that'll be some picture. You can combine all of them and say that's a wave function, or you can just combine three and be like that's the wave function. And the other things, 
I do not know what they are called. Um, I don't think they're quite operators, so we're going to have to invent a new word. And I will show you why we're going to have to invent a new word. At least I don't think there's currently a word for this. Now let's say we want to calculate the average value of some operator. So the average value of our operator a is equal to our wave function and then a gets squished between the wave functions basically. And so we plug our wave function that depends on time into here and we get Okay, so that's what your average value would look like. Um, and then over here, don't forget to take your complex conjugate of the bra. <laughs> now, the only thing that's different between the pictures is the way you um, think about how these are combined. Um, so, yeah, I, said, I was saying we need a, to invent a new word um, for these things that are squished between the operator and at least this part three of the wave function. And so I'm going to call this part here the right which. And that just helps me think about it because, you know, I think of a sandwich. So there's the ending, and it's to the right of the operator, so that's where the right comes from. And over here, this will be the left which. And I'm totally making these words up. They are not real. So people are going to laugh at you if you use these and you're trying to sound smart or something. So, I'm yeah, I'm calling this right which that left which and notice that they're complex conjugates of each other. Okay, so now, on to our first picture. We'll start with the Schrodinger picture. So in the Schrodinger picture... Schrodinger. The wave functions depend on time. They're time dependent. Operators are not. Um, or we'll say they're time independent so in other words the Schrodinger wave functions which you'll call psi sub s um, combine 1 2 and 3 And they say that's the wave function. So basically, your Schrodinger wave function is time dependent. So you get a rate that depends on time. It's equal to 1. And I said 1 is this part. 2, which is this part. And 3, which is this part. And that's simple as that. That's the Schrodinger wave function. And a Schrodinger operator, which sometimes you see it as a sub s, it's just a constant. It does not depend on time. It's time independent. So that's all there is for the Schrodinger picture. The Schrodinger picture is what most people learn in undergrad quantum mechanics, but... Typically, they won't tell you you're learning the Schrodinger wave function. You later figure that out um, after being completely lost for a long time. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this most general wave function um, and what the 1, 2, and 3 there.
Okay, so now that we've done the Schrodinger picture, let's go to the Heisenberg picture. So in the Heisenberg picture, the wave functions, time independent. And the operators are what's time dependent. Wave functions don't depend on time, operators do. So, in other words, the Heisenberg wave function, which you might see as psi sub h, combines, combines, oh, it doesn't combine anything really. It's just three. So, it's just this part. And these are also called stationary states. So the Heisenberg wave functions are the Schrodinger stationary states, or just the stationary states. But the Heisenberg operators, which you might see as A sub H, well, see, this is the confusing part, at least on Wikipedia. <laughs> so I think it's confusing to write it like some people do. How I like to think about it is you always think of the average value. So our general average value is um, our wave function sandwiched between the operators. And so let's write that out again. Okay, so we can see if in the Heisenberg representations, the wave functions are time independent. Well, these are the wave functions. And th that's the only time independent part. So this is the Heisenberg wave function. So the operator must be, well, this whole thing here. Or what I'm calling the right which is this part here. So you'll see the Heisenberg, you'll see all of this, and people, this is what people mean when they say A sub H. That's the Heisenberg operator. It just combines one and two into the operator. So in Heisenberg, Heisenberg operators combine one and two. So that's the Heisenberg picture. And he liked this picture because Heisenberg liked working with matrices instead of functions. And it's just easier to think about these things in terms of matrices and instead of in terms of um, functions. Anyways, the interaction picture. It's intermediate between these. And you can probably guess um, where it's going. So the wave functions are time dependent. And so are the operators. So now the interaction wave functions are two and three. And that's important. It's two and three. It's not one and three. It's two and three. So, the interaction wave function is 2 times 3, which I'll write that out. So that's the interaction wave function, part 2 and 3. Now the interaction operator or the right which, let's say um, interaction right which. Well, it's just this part, number one. And again, we can think about the average value, and we write that whole thing out.
Okay, so the interaction operator is this. So this is what you'll see as a sub i. And the interaction wave function is this part. So the interaction picture, it's good for when you know how your system behaves without the presence of a perturbation. that perturbation being V of T. And you want to find out how your system will behave if you do apply a perturbation V of T. Because you can see, if V of T is gone here, well, essentially, the interaction picture, let's see, the if V of T is not present, the interaction picture is going to be the same as the Heisenberg picture. Because up here we said these parts belong to the Heisenberg operator. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay. So, that's basically it. I mean, to wrap up, we can think about all the different pictures and when you get confused, just write out the average value and group certain terms together. And now notice when I did this one, I switched the order of this and this. And I think you can do that. I think that's okay. I might be breaking some rules. I would have to check. But this is a good way to think about it. So we have our interaction operator and our wave function operator. Now let me rewrite this um, to make things nice and neat on the next. Okay, so our view, and you can repeat this process every time you get confused because this is kind of like a hierarchical thing. So in the Schrodinger picture, this is our operator. So this is A sub S. And the Schrodinger wave function is all the stuff over here. In the Heisenberg picture, you move out a little bit. So in the Heisenberg picture, not the Heisenberg picture, the interaction picture. In the interaction picture, you, you move out one step because it's intermediate, right? You think about the interaction picture intermediate between Schrodinger and Heidinger. <laughs> Heisenberg. <laughs> okay, so this is the interaction operator. And over here, we have the interaction wave function. And finally, with the Heisenberg operator, well, since we know the Heisenberg operator is uh, wave functions that are time independent it has to be everything besides these two things. So, everything besides those two things is the Heisenberg operator, and this little thing over here is the Heisenberg wave function. So, I hope that clears the pictures up for you guys. Hope that helped. Uh, thanks for watching, and have a great day.